United States, of course, people are fighting for freedom. Freedom to have a haircut. And in, in India, we tried uh, relaxing a little bit. People are fighting for freedom to get drunk. <laughs> there were some hopes uh, because certain scientific studies, we can say it's a study and also more of a kind of a scientific theory which talks about an arc gene or genome which could have played a profound influence on the growth of our brain and the development of who we are today many million years ago was largely instigated by a virus. But looking at the human behavior with partial relaxation, this virus doesn't seem to have worked like that. <laughs> with a burst of new intelligence, it's not happened. Hopefully, the virus will mutate itself into that kind of a virus that a higher level of brain power happens. Well, it is also noted that in the development of mammals who are right now categorized as the highest level of evolution on the planet, development and evolution of ability to produce placenta is believed that it's the virus some hundred million years ago which could have instigated this process within very primitive mammals which existed at that time. This is the basis of nutrients passing from mother to child and hence a full-grown child being... no, not full-grown in that sense, but a full-formed child being delivered, whether it is a... it is a human being or a cow or a dog or all these mammals, has become possible mainly because of development of placenta and that could have been instigated or has been instigated by some virus hundred million years ago. So you don't know what treasures this virus is holding for you. Maybe your brain will develop or something else will happen, maybe you'll grow a horn. <laughs> because people are killing rhinoceros for a single horn, single horn, not even two. So if you grow your own horn, maybe the rhinoceros will have a party. In some way, we don't know what advantages will come out of it, but right now, uh, this happened. Chankaran Pillai went to Mumbai because he got a job there, not now, pre-virus, before the virus era. And he got a job, he was working, but he had no place to stay, he's looking for an apartment. He just wants a one-bedroom apartment somewhere. Entire evenings into late night and early mornings, every day he went from place to place, place to place, wanting to find an apartment. It is not uh, those days that you could type it out and somebody will deliver an apartment, you have to go physically looking for them. After a month of search, no apartment. Because he was sleeping on the beach, because there was no other place. Early morning he was walking on the beach and he saw a small vessel lying on the sand. He picked it up and uh, just rubbed it with his hand, lo, a genie popped out. Then uh, Shankaran Pillai said, Oh, genie, you've come, please get me an apartment in Mumbai. The genie said, You bloody fool, if I could find an apartment for you, would I be living in this tiny little place? <laughs> 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 so
So those of you who are looking for a magic wand way out of the virus situation, there is no magic wand. Very conscientious, responsible steps are needed from individuals, from businesses, from the state, from the world, this is what is needed. One good thing or one thing that has happened, I'm taking back the word good because many will fight with me <laughs> One thing that's happened is uh, all the places of prayers are sh have been shut down. And uh, many religious leaders are super insecure right now because if people learn to live without God and pretty well, this is going to be dangerous <laughs> This will be destruction of a major industry. Six weeks, if you can live without seeing your God, without communicating with Him, without asking for this or that or even daily bread, if it still happened, then you may get confidence to walk on your own, you know. Very dangerous for the industry. It's a major industry, you can't let it die like that. But all these things are happening. As you, many of you may not know, uh, because only probably in close circles I have spoken about this, this is a movement from religion to responsibility. Essentially what it means is, people have been living here with responsibility somewhere way up in the sky. We don't know where. It's time human respo responsibility moves here not somewhere else. So I think this virus in some way is assisting our movement of moving humanity from religion to responsibility. If religion is propagating some aspects of spiritual process for individual people, that is fine because Every religion at some point started as a spiritual movement and then got organized, 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 got super organized and uh, it became something else altogether. So I'm sure in every religion there are elements of spiritual process. If those things are brought out, it's fine. But this daily bothering of God which you call as prayer, this a daily uh, self-appointed advisory to God, what he should do today. Of all the people, I think God should be the happiest with virus. <laughs> because six weeks, nobody to bother him, you know. <laughs> Never it's happened in a long time, not in two thousand years or so. <clears throat> So there are many pluses, if you are on the side of the creator, you also have lots of pluses. <sniffs> Only thing is, we may have to learn to live with little less, which I think is wonderful if all of us learn to do that. Hmm? Yes, all of you, I'm telling you, you must all learn to, don't wait for economy to go down and this and that. Everybody just look at how you can reduce your consumption by twenty-five percent, whatever you're consuming. Electricity, water, uh, clothing, anything and anything that you're doing, twenty-five percent less. Food also. <laughs> Believe me, if you do a few things with yourself, little bit of sadhana within you, you will become a very energy-efficient machine. That is, with much less fuel, you will function much better. That's what every technology in the world is trying to do right now. But all these technologies are being created by this technology, this piece of technology which we call as human being. If this is not energy-efficient, 
uh, other machines becoming energy efficient, one day your car may turn around and say, you idiot, why are you driving me? That's why already self-driving machines are coming, because in the next ten, fifteen years, cars believe we can drive better than human beings. I don't want to be around on that day <laughs> So, <laughs> so the virus has many possibilities if you reduce all the consumption that you're making in your life, twenty-five percent less, your brains will work very well. Tch. See, it's also there in the scientific studies that some millions of years ago, human brain started working because of this arc genome or whatever. So whether the genome comes or not, you spark, don't wait for the arc. <laughs> you must spark to see that now this virus, a bloody little thing, you know, the world has, you know, this happened. <laughs> Many years ago there was a wise man in uh, Coimbatore city. When people were simply attacking us for nothing, they were talking about coming in truckloads and ripping our ashram down, yoga center down. It was easy to do that because we were just one big hut. We were just a thatch roof hut, so people planning, come, we will go there and rip it down. Why? I think even they did not know. But uh, because they thought this arrogance of religion to responsibility, it's the worst kind of arrogance that they can think of. Because of that, suddenly people were sparking up in Coimbatore wanting to do their own thing. So they said, what is this? Everybody is becoming free, we can't let this happen <laughs> So when they were saying that, there was a wise old man who said, don't throw stones at this man, you don't know who he is. If you throw stones, he will build something out of it <laughs> You… you see all the stonework. When I say modern, that's been built in twenty-first century has this much stone, because a lot of people have been throwing, throwing stones at us, so we thought we should make it all stone. Now they are throwing virus at me, the world is throwing virus at me, I've decided we'll go viral. <laughs> so there is a whole strategic thinking and action and various uh, things going on, I want all of you to be a part of it. One thing we will do, uh, everybody's telling me don't tell them so soon. So I'll tell you because it's come. So uh, we will launch a, a simple but powerful program where Forty days with Sadhguru, online. <laughs> Don't clap, online. That is twenty-four hours of the day. Sadhguru will wake you up, Sadhguru will walk you through the day, Sadhguru will put you to sleep and stay with you during your sleep and wake you up again in the morning. We're we evolving this, this program. Yoga day. We will launch twenty-first of June. If you want to be there, you better start booking up. Right now even the booking is not open but I've announced, but you start putting your names out there because maybe we will have to… we will have to stop at a certain number for technological reasons. So forty days with Sadhguru, it's never happened before, so we thought uh, because people don't even know how to wake up properly and fall asleep properly. Uh, there is a certain way, you know, there is a certain way to start the engine of a vehicle. If you do it the wrong way, it will not function the same way. One who knows what it is, 
does it in certain ways. Others simply boom, they will do and their machines are like that only. So, it is important how you start this machine in the morning and how you put it to rest. You want to turn off your computer, there is a process, isn't it? Simply put off the switch in the wall. Tomorrow morning, when you want to work again, it has lots of troubles. The same with this, how to turn it down, how to bring it back, there is a way. And how to walk it through the day. So, forty days, twenty-four hours, with Sadhguru, all right? So now that, uh, you know, now that I'm becoming a full-time painter and a part-time spiritual teacher, <laughs> we thought we'll show you some things <laughs> Yes, which is that one, first one? Okay, let me see it here. Such are the ways of vanity, even a feather sits upon a man's brow. <laughs> How many silly ways a human being is trying to enhance himself when everything in this world is telling you, you are the highest possible piece of life on this planet. You got to fix what a bird drops, you have to put it up on your head to feel. In like this, beads and bones and feathers and this and that and maybe a stupid diamond. Because a feather comes free, diamond is a, a bloody cruel thing. So how many ways, how many silly idiotic ways a human being struggles to find little enhancement? When we are the highest piece of life on this planet. So, if all those enhancements have failed and at least the virus has made you realize wearing diamonds and walking around in the house is a bloody silly thing, if you realize that, it's time for yoga. Mm hmm Are questions? Namaskaram Sadhguru, when someone is ill and on the verge of death, is that the time to give comfort and solace? or talk about death and prepare them for it? Oh! See, when someone is ill, and if that someone has unfortunately never truly realized life is mortal and they have not prepared for it, in any way within themselves, at that time you tell them you're going to die now, he's going to be terrible. Well, when someone becomes ill, in many ways they become helpless. In that helplessness, they become like a little child or a, you know, they become like little children. You love the child so much, there are two aspects to it, one is, one is he or she is small and cute. Another is, they're helpless, you like it. Yes, yes. If you have a husband or a wife who is super 
efficient about everything they need, they can do it themselves. No, no, you will not like that person. You will need somebody who doesn't know how to find his socks. You will curse, but you like it because you know these are the controls you have over life. I've seen, you know, women talking about, you know, my husband cannot even find his toothbrush in the morning, but they're very proud of it. <laughs> because when he's so helpless, without me he cannot live. That's the thing. Because all relationships are need-based relationships, societies have evolved like this. So suddenly telling them you're going to die may not be a great idea. In this country, it was made a very significant thing. People have kind of all dissipated this fundamental wisdom. It was very important to have a son. Not because of gender discrimination, because the nature and the format of the society was such, if you had daughters, at a certain age they will go away. So even if they are ten or twenty-five kilometers away from you in a nearby village, well, she is either pregnant or she has a young child or she has responsibilities of that house that she has gone to, and twenty-five kilometers she has to walk and come, there is no transportation. So most probably if you are dying, she won't come. This is always the case. Once again we've gone to the same place now because most people, their children are in some other country, in some other faraway place that they cannot come. Or it's because of virus they cannot come. So because of this, having a son was very important because one fundamental duty which was very well established in this society, unfortunately forgotten today is, the moment a parent becomes to a place where the man gets married, let's say the son gets married, the moment that happens, it is one of the duties of the son is to take the parents on uh, yatra to the pilgrim places. This is not tourism. This is to remind them that they are mortal, their time is rapidly coming, this is the time to invest in their inner well-being. Recently there was one video which has gone viral around the country, a man carrying his old mother. You seen that video? Because this guy was very ill when he was young and he, they, everybody thought he will die. But his mother did not give up and she prayed to some god so intensely and without any medication this guy bounced back. So since then he's been wanting to take his mother which is her dream to go to pilgrim places in the country. Now being a poor man, he didn't have money, he just put a bamboo thing one side, some things that he needs, clothes, this and that, another side his mother, and he's carrying her and walking from all the places to places wherever she had wished to go across the country, carrying his mother and another equal amount of load at the back and walking, this video has just gone crazy all over the country. Because this was the fundamental duty, before they become incapable of walking and doing things, a son must take them to pilgrim places. Pilgrim places not for tourism purposes, but to remind them that they need to turn inward. Well, that is gone completely out of our thing, we are all thinking even if you are seventy or eighty, you must be going to the cinema, you must be going to the party, you must be doing this, you must be doing that. Because this whole thing has come to us from the West, even if you're eight, eighty, you must behave like you're eighteen. Now also you must be on the dating app. Yes, they are, unfortunately. So, suddenly telling them may not be a good idea, this is something only you can judge on… based on an individual person, there is no common prescription, but it is important before they become ill, this must be brought forth to them. They should not go with this ignorance that they are going to live forever. So, they will get engaged with their children to some extent, then their own careers and jobs and whatever, they're retired, now they're getting old. 
Now they are desperate grandchildren, where are the grandchildren? How come you love those children who are not yet born so much? When you have no care or concern for children who are on the street, how come you have so much love for children who don't exist? Because you want to get engaged with life once again, as if it's a new beginning. Because it'll give you a new lease of life, another level of involvement, another level of illusion about things will go on forever. So if all those things are not there, people will get frustrated, they will lose their minds, all these things will happen unfortunately. So whether you should tell them or not, if they are ill and moving towards their time, maybe not in so many words, but you must create an atmosphere that it comes home to them. Otherwise, you're doing a great injustice. You're doing a great injustice by creating a fake atmosphere, everything will be okay, no, no, we're going to go back home, you're in a hospital, don't worry, we're going to go back home, everything is going to be fine. And then uh, your grandson's wedding is coming uh, five years later, we will do, what shall we do, planning for that. This is a rubbish way of existence. It is very important for every human being that when we are approaching the closure of our time, we approach it in a sensible and conscious way, as far as possible. If you are absolutely conscious, there's nothing to say about it, that will be managed. Otherwise, they did not live like that, they don't have that ability right now, but you must create an atmosphere that it is moving in this direction. You may not be able to directly tell them, they may get terrified, they may get scared and you know, all those things. But you must create an atmosphere, a spiritual atmosphere, when we say spiritual, something that's not of the body, that's all. Right now, life is moving you to a place where it is not about the body anymore. They must get this point. But in many homes today, it's… I've, I've been in some homes unfortunately where this happened, they are trying to cook all their favorite foods and say, eat this, eat that. Maybe if that is your way of preponing their death, it's unfortunate again. That is not the way of doing it. It is very, very, very important that bodily concerns must be brought down. Of food, of this and comfort and clothing, you must bring it down and make it very clear to them. If not by words, by setting up an atmosphere, that our time is coming. It'll come to all of us. When it comes to this person, it is important the necessary atmosphere is provided and the whole family or whoever else is there creates that ambience of not pulling them into this and that but allowing them to move in that direction. There are many simple things one can do, I think in the death book we have handled this elaborately, but simple things you can do is just an oil lamp, a vegetable oil lamp or a ghee lamp. Oil lamp is better. I'm sorry, vegetable oil lamp is better, a lamp, some simple chant or something which reminds you that it's not about the body. If this much reminder is there, there is enough wisdom in life to latch on to that. But if you not said a word till now, somebody is not oriented at all in this direction, suddenly you go tell them you're going to die. That could be very cruel and it could unnecessarily create a disturbance which is not necessary for that person. So how it needs to be done is important, everybody. See, don't cr try to create a situation of normalcy around that person. Everybody bounding around, children coming and saying, Grandma, Grandpa, I love you, everything is great. Don't create that. Even if children are there, if they come in, they must come in slowly and just be like that. They must understand situations are changing. If they… if you do not even create that, you put on a cinema, you do this, you cook all their favorite foods, you're b b you know, bouncing around them to make them feel everything is great, this is not the way. It's important, there is nothing wrong with death. It is just a part of our existence, it is just the way we conduct it. It's very important. This is a fundamental duty of the children towards their parents that 
when their time comes, they will live well. Simplest thing is, if you turn spiritual initially, they will resist, they will struggle, but after that, it's a natural intelligence of a human being. Somebody who's half my age is not focusing on, you know, physiological and psychological compulsions and they're doing something with themselves. What am I doing? This will naturally come in any human being. So, if you are doing any spiritual practice or anything, it's good to do it in front of your parents, even if they're not interested. <laughs> yes. Even if they have resistance and they're not interested, it's good to close your eyes and sit. Slowly it will dawn on them because there is a profound intelligence within this which knows that this is not forever. It is in the body. Unfortunately, it's not gotten into the head. Hmm? Next question is from Anand Bhushan from Patna. Namaskaram Sadhguru. India's farmers are already poor and struggling. Now with the virus situation, lakhs of migrants are going back to their villages. Won't this further put stress on the farmers and the farmland and lead to greater poverty? Is there any solution to this? Well, I uh, hope this migrant movement is a temporary movement. Only concern is, if uh, if this had happened at the beginning of the lockdown, if we had engineered and organized this at the beginning of the lockdown and six weeks of stay in the village and they had come back, now it would be good to start all the industry and business. But now it is happening at the end of the lockdown. This is not very good, but nobody knew how long the lockdown will be. Initially we thought it's fifteen days, so we try to keep them in the cities and make accommodations and food and works. But when fifteen days it did not end, everybody was okay up to fifteen days. When the second lockdown came, they became alarmed because most of the migrant labor in India at least are only men, it's a male population. Their women and children are at home in the village, they keep visiting them. When the second lockdown extension happened, that's when they got alarmed that what is happening to our wives and children because many of them couldn't pay phone bills to be in contact with their families. Now they wanted to go, they started walking, many of them walked two hundred, three hundred kilometers and people have cycled over thousand kilometers to get to their villages. Now they're arranging trains but now we are planning to break the lockdown but now all the labor is moving away from the city which is not the best way to do. Is this of a… some kind of a problem for agriculture? No. Uh, agriculture will do well because this has been a major problem in the villages, there is not enough labor to do any work. Now if this labor goes back, it will be more than sufficient or excess, but still, uh, of course the labor uh, you know, the amount that needs to be paid out will come down, so the farmer could benefit out of it, unless there is a total influx of population. No, because in the city it looks like that, when they go to the villages, they're going to spread into hundreds of villages or thousands of villages. So, this migrant labor which looks like a huge force in the city, when it goes into the hinterlands of India, they will spread out into thousands of villages. I don't think there'll be such a big influx except maybe a a few villages in northern India. So that is not going to be a problem for agriculture, but that's going to be a problem for various businesses, uh, households and industry and above all construction industry which mainly depends on migrant labor. So it… there is… there are a lot of challenges out here. It is not uh, a simple situation, it's a never before kind of situation. The number of migrant labor in the country is somewhere between hundred and twenty to hundred and forty million people. That many people moving from one place to another is a recipe for many problems. Unfortunately, sixteen of them walking on the railway track and going, they're so exhausted, they slept on the track and a train just smashed through them in the night. 
So these kind of uh, unfortunate disasters are happening, but uh, there is a certain resilience to this country that uh, it is capable of bouncing back because our economy is built in a certain way. This is not run by a few corporations or this or that, this is run by one billion Indians. So it has the capacity to bounce back uh, because the, our production and our consumption are largely within the nation itself. Well, everybody has to look at many ingenious ways and innovative ways of doing things. The same old way of doing things will not work for anybody. Not even for us here at Isha is it going to work. Uh, we'll have to change many things and innovate in many different ways uh, to keep what we are doing going. And everybody has to do this, all businesses. Well, a segment of businesses may become irrelevant, new possibilities may come forth, many, many things are there. These are challenging times for sure. So, as I said in the very beginning of the lockdown, one concern is that people should not move towards starvation. Fortunately, it's not happened. Well, people have struggled a little bit, but everywhere, many organizations and the state governments all have responded and ensured there are no starvation deaths. So, if we ensure that one thing doesn't happen, all of us are deprived of something that we had six weeks ago, I think it's all right. I think it's all right. I know a lot of people are going to throw brick bats at me for this, but I think it's all right. We will live with a little less, it's perfectly fine. It's fine with me, it should be fine with everybody, that we will live with little less than what we were doing. In many ways, human beings have been an excess. So now, a little less is okay, but we must ensure nobody starves, nobody goes without basic nourishment. If that one thing we take care of, well, in a few months it'll bounce back, but the problem is the whole virus situation is so uh, volatile right now. We were talking about breaking this lockdown on 17th, when two weeks ago we spoke about it. The fatalities in India was less than thousand. Today it's around twenty-three hundred and uh, fortunately, it's all gotten squished uh, to one segment of the country, mainly Maharashtra, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Delhi, the main hotspots, and unfortunately Tamil Nadu. Tch. No, it's unfortunate everywhere, but <laughs> I'm saying this is an isolated happening, they're all connected. When we say Maharashtra, for those of you who do not know the geography of this country, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Delhi, these are all connected geographically, so it's happening there in a big way. Tamil Nadu is totally in the south, but unfortunately it's happening here when the other states around us are free from it, which has happened due to certain reasons, I think at some point, some study or investigation needs to happen why it happened the way it happened, anyway. But the number of fatalities are rising by the day, I think right now every day about 120 to 150 people are dying in the country of virus. It is way better than United States, but that is not a, a either a solace or a solution because once we break the lockdown, United States did not lock down as rigidly as we did. In spite of the lockdown, this is happening. Once we relax the lockdown, anybody's guess? So I want all of you, all of you, wherever you are to understand the real responsibility of maintaining social distance and all the other protocol that's been repeatedly spoken about really starts from seventeenth onwards. Till now, most of us have been protected by isolating ourselves. Now when we have to step out and other people start coming and going, this is when the real challenge happens. This is when really how responsible and sensible we are matters. After the lockdown is over, when the economic process begins, well, will it go out of control or what will happen, we have to see. One pluses and minuses of this is, 
Well, there is always people are comparing this to Spanish flu, which happened in, uh, to, uh, you know, 2009, I'm sorry, 1919, which killed over 50 million people. Twelve to seventeen million people died in India alone. Spanish flu, why did it come to India? <laughs> it did not start in Spain, it got the name because post-World War I, there was so much transaction from that place and it burst out there, then it spread all over the place. But we don't have to compare this to Spanish flu because Spanish flu largely killed people between twenty and forty years of age. This is killing people who are generally over sixty-five, seventy years of age or other vulnerable population with certain inherent uh, problems in their system. And another thing is uh, the, the, the minus point of this one is it doesn't kill as quickly as Spanish flu, but there is asymptomatic transmission in this. With Spanish flu, the moment you got it, we would know you got it, nobody would come near you. But at that time, we didn't have any antibiotics. Now we have variety of medicines, even if we get infected, there's a way to deal with that. So we are not looking at that level of fatalities in the world. But in to what extent our activities will be crippled, that is the thing. Well, there's a whole lot of people who are saying, you know, scientific language is being thrown around by all kinds of people saying that uh, we will develop uh, uh, herd immunity. See, to develop herd immunity, about sixty to seventy percent of the population should get infected. If this happens, we will wipe out a significant segment of the geriatric population. People over seventy-five years of age, we will almost wipe out that population in the world and maybe infants below one year of age also, and all the vulnerable people, those who have been through transplants, uh, people with cardiac problems, diabetics, and uh, various other things are there which come under this category. So all the vulnerable population we will be wiping out. So herd immunity is not really a solution that way because that means we are deciding. The very word herd is something I can't take when you refer to the human beings. Herd immunity, you talk about this in animals, the same thing we are talking about it, about human beings because the viruses come from animals right now and this whole thing. But it will wipe out the vulnerable population if you are looking at seventy percent infection around the world. So how to stop it? Nobody has a clue. Only thing is, we have some ideas about how to slow it down. And the best thing you can do is how to enhance the immunity in your system, we can give you a protocol how to maintain this in the ashram from in the next three days we will put out things as to how to enhance your humanity beyond what it is right now because from seventeenth onwards people from outside may start coming in, transactions will happen, we'll keep it to the minimum but still it's inevitable, we can't be closed down forever. This is true everywhere. So it is important a few simple things, uh, do, do I have that sheet? Okay. One thing is strict maintenance of uh, social distancing, this must become your religion. Okay? That is if you're religious, I'm saying. Otherwise, this must become your sadhana. <laughs> well, in the yoga center, everybody is popping uh, the neem ball in the morning, neem and turmeric. So in next two days, the green ball will disappear, only the turmeric ball will be there, but there will be neem leaves. So before you go for your morning sadhana, you must take eight to twelve leaves and put it in your mouth, chew it and keep it in your mouth. It's very important it's in your mouth. It's most effective when it's in your mouth region. So you must keep it in your mouth, chew it for one to two hours, let it be there, don't wash it up, don't drink it down, let it just be there in the mouth, do your sadhana with that. Wherever you are <laughs> Are What? No, I'm just trying to avoid bad breath in the sadhana hall. 
So wherever you are, at least in this country, you find neem leaf, you can do that. There could be other herbs and things in other nations where there is no le uh, neem leaf, but it's best you find out, I don't want to suggest something, I'm not uh, very conversant with that. Turmeric balls, every day mixing up, if you have organic turmeric, we will be... We have been working on this, probably in a month's time, we will have a supply of uh, well-grown organic turmeric, uh, which may work out a little more expensive than the regular turmeric, but it is best that way, that every day you consume this in the morning and leave it in the stomach before you eat anything, at least for one hour. This will do wonders for you. And Nilavembu Kashayam, which we are distributing all over the villages here, to the workers and everybody, to the migrant workers and all this. One thing we have noticed is in this part of Tamil Nadu where we are working, there has not been a single case in the last two months, not a single case. One thing is effective social distance policing by us and the authorities, and Nilavem Bukashayam and a few other things we are doing. So if you maintain these protocols, very easily you can enhance your immune system because ultimately that's the only way you have. Another thing is, this is the Amla season, that is the Nalikai for Kannada people, the better Nalikai. So right now the season is on, not those huge, uh, you know, golf ball kind of Amla, that is all hybrid Amla, that is also okay if you don't find anything else. But otherwise, what grows in the hills is only this size. You just smash one amla and put a little salt on it and just chew it. You must keep it in your mouth and it's most effective once again in your mouth. It must be just in your mouth for one or two hours. These simple things will greatly enhance your uh, hmm, immune system. And to drink uh, hot water about four to five times a day, just plain hot water or you can put a little bit of uh, coriander or mint or uh, you can add a pinch of turmeric or even little lime juice and drink that regularly. And well, in your living spaces, walking spaces, places that you're using, spraying of Lysol, don't drink it, don't inject it. Uh, <laughs> And uh, this will happen here at the yoga center. The, we're planning how to accommodate them and what to do. This may sound a little bit of discomfort for many of you, but you have to do this. The vulner vulnerable population in the ashram will be separated from the younger population. It is very important this is done because uh, what may be perfectly fine for a young person, another person could uh, be fatal, it could be fatal for the other person. So we want to separate the vulnerable population. This uh, work is going on. You must do this in your homes also, if there are people beyond a certain age or they have some other ailment which makes them vulnerable, it's important that you clearly separate yourself from them. How long? We don't know. Nobody knows. It's anybody's guess. Right now, if you look at the Spanish flu, the way it happened, it started in the month of January, it took a certain toll, but it again, the second wave happened in the month of August, September, that is when it took the maximum number of people. So certain doctors and scientists are expecting a second wave will happen between October and December in most nations. Whether it will happen in India or not, or it'll happen across India because the weather conditions are very different from place to place here in this country. Uh, in United States also, it may be true, the southern America, how it works and the northern part of the country, how it responds, it could be different, we don't know for sure. Because uh, they've, they've shown resilience to survive in any kind of weather. There was hope when the summer comes, they will go down, but that's not happening. Now we have a new hope, when the monsoon comes, it'll do go down. This is just our hope. The virus may learn to thrive in all these conditions. There is no... there is no proof that it will actually go down. So the second wave, when it comes, when we relax our guard and we start getting into activity, when the second wave comes, that is when humanity may pay uh, a very large price. 
So this is why we want to separate the vulnerable population. Every one of you in your homes, if you have such people, you must keep a clear distance, absolute distance. How long? Unfortunately, we do not know how long. Nobody hand knows how long, everybody is making guesswork. Don't do guesswork with people's lives. And about the migrant labor and all this happening, all of them need not necessarily come back to city if you ask me. I've been talking to uh, business groups and uh, you know entrepreneurs around the world. Yesterday we had an event with Thai, today with a, with a news channel. So this is something I'm constantly trying to put this across. This has been... we've been doing this for over fifteen, twenty years. Many people are listening, little bit of action has happened, but not enough action has happened. The simple thing is just this. The statistics says some seventy-two percent of the world's investment is just in some thirty-one or thirty-two cities or thirty-six cities, I think. When seventy-two percent of the world's wealth is centered in just a few cities, why will people not move there? Naturally, they will move there. It's estimated in the next ten years, before this virus it was estimated, that in ten years' time about 1.6 billion people will migrate in the world. I want you to imagine the horrors of that. 1.6 billion people dragging their women and children and uh, you know, picking up their stuff, leaving places where they've lived for generations, for hundreds of years and going to another place, the atrocities that they go through is unbelievable. In India it was estimated, 220 million people will move from rural India to urban India. Well, those of you who are living in cities, I want you to imagine, let's say ten cities in India, 220 million people, even if you distribute evenly, which will not happen, you can imagine the plight of those cities. So one significant thing that needs to happen is, investments must spread. This whole Manchester style of uh, building industry, because that's where this mass production system started and they brought it everywhere, everything has to be done in one place, everybody come to one place and work, this has to go. Right now a whole lot of people are talking about working from home and stuff like this, but this is only relevant to a certain band of people who do certain type of work. But for others, they have to go somewhere. But that somewhere need not necessarily be concentrated in one city, it needs to spread. If we do not focus on this, that across the seven hundred and odd districts in the country, if you do not spread industry, even if it's little difficult to begin with, if we do not do that, the migration will go crazy. Another thing is agroforestry. Agroforestry is a sure way of stopping migration, because one reason why migrants move is whenever there is a drought, in uh, agricultural lands. It happens every five, six years or eight years, there'll be one big drought. When that happens, waves of migrations will happen. People will leave their land and go to the city and they'll never come back. If you had long-term crops in your land, if you have trees standing in your land, you are not going to leave your land and go away because there is money standing there. So agroforestry is one of the best ways to stop migration to the cities. If we don't do that now, our cities will become unlivable, not just in India, almost everywhere in the world, this migration, if this billion and odd people start moving and piling up in one city, nobody can live well. This idea of concentrated population is a hotbed for even a future pandemic. If the entire... we usually like to call this a global village, if it was really a village, I'm telling you, the virus would be quite helpless because it's a city. The Wuhan city itself is supposed to have eleven million population. And how many cities have over ten million population in the world? There are too many. Why ten million people have come to one place? Is it because they're in love with each other? I don't think so. Simply because economic opportunity is all concentrated in one place. This has to spread. If we don't spread this, not only in India, across the world, economic 
possibilities must spread across geography, it's very, very important. Agroforestry is a significant step in this direction. Hmm. This question is... Oh, we have time? Okay, last question, please. This question is from Ahuti. Namaskaram Sadhguru. Women are socially conditioned to protect themselves since their childhood. Also in one of your talks you mentioned that survival instinct is stronger in them. Will this self-preservative mindset of a woman be a hindrance for her in the spiritual journey? <laughs> this happened in Alandurai. For those of you who do not know, Alandurai is a village uh, just about twelve kilometers from here where we are. Actually, it is named after an Englishman who was a hunter in this region, an elephant hunter. His name is Alan. <laughs> and uh, at that time, you had to call them master. All the English people, the local people had to refer to them as master. So in the local language, it's Dorai. So it's Alan Dorai has become Alandurai. <laughs> so, in this Alandurai, two donkeys met, <laughs> real ones. I mean to say four, four-legged ones. <laughs> in case you're thinking I'm being nasty, no. <laughs> real donkeys, they met. One was very well-fed and doing well. Another one came and he was emaciated and looking quite pathetic. Then they got to talking and uh, inquiring about each other. They have no virus concerns, so they're talking about their own life. So one asked the other, why are you stuck in this job? with your owner. See, I escaped from my master, I am my own. I go and eat what I want. See how I am, look at you, a pathetic creature. Then the other donkey said, yes, my master is a cruel man. He hardly gives me any food, he beats me, he abuses me, uses all kinds of ba bad words, he even abuses my mother.